So, old Mendel, uh, in his work, had uh, a number of different findings, and what I'd like to do is uh, go through some of what he had discerned uh, through his work uh, and combine that or sort of put that in the context um, of what we know today. So we'll discuss Mendel's findings uh, using vocabulary uh, appropriate for uh, our knowledge or uh, familiarity with uh, modern genetics. So first off, uh, he was able to refute the uh, hypothesis of blending. So he was able to show uh, that information uh, was passed on in the form of discrete packets of information that we refer to as genes. He called them heritable factors, having no idea uh, of, of genes, but we know that uh, genes will get passed on from parent to offspring. Okay, uh, secondly, he w was able to uh, discern that there are different uh, forms of genes. Uh, again, we refer to those different forms uh, as uh, alleles that get passed on uh, from parent to offspring. So, uh, for instance, you know, there could be uh, genes for coat color that are brown, black, gray, white, tan. So all these different alleles uh, can be passed on or forms of genes can be passed on from parent to offspring. Now, uh, he was additionally able to uh, clarify that uh, an organism gets two copies. Okay, So an organism gets two alleles uh, per gene or for each gene, uh, one from each parent. Uh, now, when looking at these alleles, one may be dominant uh, to the other. And that is how he dis, uh, explained the uh, flower color uh, findings that uh, you know, the allele for the gene or heritable factor uh, for purple flower color was dominant to uh, the gene that got passed on for uh, white flowers. Uh, another way to look at this uh, could be pigmentation. So for instance, uh, hair color, skin color, eye color, uh, darker uh, colors or darker traits are dominant to lighter traits because uh, the genes for the darker traits produce more of the pigment, whereas uh, genes for the lighter traits produce less of the pigment. So you know, the dominant allele basically ends up producing uh, more pigment, which leads to uh, a different variant or different uh, trait for a particular color. Uh, let's see. Now this is just fascinating that he was able to figure this out. So the two alleles uh, per trait or per gene they segregate from one another uh, during meiosis one. So if we think of uh, the chromosomes that we've been drawing, so here are these homologous chromosomes, similar in size, shape, banding pattern. These homologous chromosomes can have alleles, say like one chromosome could have a dominant allele and the other chromosome could have recessive allele. During meiosis one, uh, these homologous chromosomes are going to separate so that the gametes that are eventually produced only have uh, one copy 
of each allele rather than uh, two copies. So really pretty tremendous that he was able to uh, discern that without having any uh, familiarity with genetics. Okay, uh, let's see. Now, uh, another fascinating uh, finding is the fact that these genes found on the individual chromosomes will uh, segregate independent of one another. So again, he had no idea of genetics. He was just able to uh, figure this out mathematically. So we know that, um, you know, thinking of a cell going through meiosis, you have the spindle fibers attaching to individual chromosomes. So how one pair of chromosomes sorts have n has no impact on how the others sort because different spindle fibers are going to attach to uh, different kinetic ores. Now, uh, we can also look at this uh, in terms of maybe a karyotype. So if we have a karyotype, uh, let's say, for instance, there is uh, on chromosome one, this is strictly hypothetical here, if there is a gene for, uh, say, chin shape. So in this instance, a uh, person would have a cleft chin. And then we go down to uh, chromosome 21. Uh, and on chromosome 21, we could hypothetically say, you have a gene for hair color. Well, since these are going to segregate independent of one another, during meiosis, just because you potentially inherit a, a gene for cleft chin has no impact on whether or not uh, you inherit a gene for brown hair color. So these uh, aren't in lockstep with one another. And it gets, again, it's because if the genes are on separate chromosomes, how these chromosomes sort uh, is independent. Now, he was able to determine this uh, with dihybrid crosses. Now, when we say dihybrid crosses, that means they are heterozygous for two traits. So uh, let's see, we could use an example like just say big Y, big R, or big Y, little Y, big R, little R. So this is a, a dihybrid cross would be between uh, two individuals, heterozygous for uh, two traits of interest. Now this is uh, spelled out in figure 14.8. I would strongly recommend spending some time uh, taking a look at this and reviewing how that information is determined. But just as a quick note, uh, make mention of the fact that if you see a dihybrid cross like this, uh, where both individuals are heterozygous for both genes of interest, you know automatically that the offspring are going to uh, exhibit uh, a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio uh, in terms of uh, traits that are produced. Uh, likewise, if you see a monohybrid cross where organisms are heterozygous for one uh, gene of interest, then you'll know automatically it's going to be a, a 3 to 1 ratio. So these are two very frequent ratios, and you'll certainly uh, want to uh, be familiar with them. All right, um, taking a look at independent assortment. Uh, uh, again, just some little detail. Since this is so significant, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, draw um, an example of independent assortment uh, to sort of help exemplify how this 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio can be produced. So let's say uh, we have an individual that has the genotype 
big T, little t, and big P, little p. Now, if these uh, genes are on separate chromosomes, uh, that will be, uh, they'll be able to sort uh, independently. So let's say we have this first chromosome, uh, where you have a big T, and then a little t. Here and on the second chromosome, we'll have a big P and a little p. Now, how these line up during metaphase one of meiosis uh, is random, so this is certainly a legitimate setup, as would this. So you can have the big T and little t lined up as they were, or you can have the P switch positions. So these are both uh, certainly uh, legitimate possibilities in terms of how these align. And what you see is that you get gametes that would have uh, different combinations of genes. So it, for instance, these gametes would get a big T and a big P. These would get little t and a little p. So all these different possibilities uh, can exist, and uh, again, you can fill out your Punnett square or mathematically derive the fact that you get a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio um, if you have individuals with these genes uh, combining gametes.